Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, the Asia Graphics Webinar Session 21. And I am Peng Bobo from Harbin Institute of Technology, Weihai, uh, China. Uh, today, we have uh, two uh, exciting talks given by two speakers. Uh, and the, the, the first talk titled From Curve to Flat Back and Back Again. A match processing for fabrication. And the, uh, the second talk is titled Piecewise Developer Automation uh, for Triangular Meshes. Uh, and before we start, I would like to introduce, give a short introduction to uh, the first speaker, uh, Professor Marilla Ben Chen uh, from Technion uh, Israel Institute of Technology. And uh, Professor Ben Chen. Uh, is an associate professor at the Center for Graphics and Geometric Computing of the CS Department at the Technion. She had received her PhD from the Technion in 2009. I was a Fulbright uh, postdoc at the Stanford from 2009 to 2012, and then started as an assistant professor at the Technion in 2012. Uh, professor Ben Chen is interested in modeling and understanding the geometry of shapes. She uses mathematical tools such as discrete differential geometry, uh, numerical optimization, and uh, harmonic analysis for applications such as animation, shape analysis, uh, fluid simulation on surfaces, and uh, computational fabrication. Uh, Professor Benjamin has won an ERC starting grant of the Henry Cobb Prize for Acad Academic Excellence. The Science Prize of the German Technion Society and the Multiple Best Paper Award. So now uh, let's welcome Professor Ben Chen. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about uh, mesh processing for fabrication. So uh, imagine somebody you know uh, at school was given a science project to build a solar system model, and it has to be to scale. Uh, and you're trying to help her and you're faced with the problem of creating shapes of many sizes um, and different colors. And um, uh, all the shapes are spheres, of course, uh, uh, except Saturn, but still uh, this is uh, challenging because you think what kind of materials can you use to do it? You go to the craft store and you have paper and cardboard and fabric and everything, everything is flat. So how do you go about building a doublet of a shape from flat materials. And, and spheres are actually easy because if you look around, um, the problem uh, is to generate um, curved shapes, okay? So uh, in general, uh, any type of shape, not necessarily a sphere. Uh, and this problem uh, comes up in different uh, fields. For example, in architecture, what you see here is a double curved shape made from uh, hexagonal planar panels um, made of wood. Um, and this is a common problem in architecture, for example. Um, another example, this is uh, furniture. So this is a kind of uh, chair. It's uh, uh, exhibited at, uh, at Banff, if you've ever been there in Canada. And it's made of uh, quadrangular um, um, bits. Uh, another example is uh, plush toys. Okay, These are also double curved shapes. Which are uh, whose interior is uh, filled, and this is also a problem in medicine. So what you see here is a kind of a stent. Well, it's a rendering; it's not a real stent, but uh, like a, a concept of having um, a stent which can be uh, inflated uh, for um, uh, healthcare. Um, and this uh, example, it's uh, bifurcated, so it's a very uh, complicated example for uh, the shape of a stent. So curved shapes are uh, essentially everywhere. And to kind of drive the, um, the discussion, I'm going to uh, give you kind of a, a thought experiment. So let's say that I want to do a bunny made of solar panels. Okay, why would I want to do that? So for example, for an outdoors exhibit for a science visit. Okay, and this is just a, a thought experiment. None of my papers talks about solar panel bunnies, but this is an interesting um, way to think about things. So uh, why why bunny? Um, so essentially, if you're uh, an engineer or a mathematician or a programmer, you want to think about uh, the complicated examples. So not necessarily spheres, something which is more elaborate. 
And um, essentially bunnies have round areas and flat areas and saddle shaped areas and creases. And uh, from my experience of, of playing with uh, 3D models, once you have your bunny, uh, the other shapes are easy. And this is a generalization, okay? So obviously you want shapes which have varied uh, types of uh, curvatures and, and features. Um, so which bunny? It can be just any bunny, right? So we get as input uh, one of the 3D shapes. And um, what we want to do is uh, um, panel it uh, with solar panels. So which solar panels? This is again something that we get as input. Uh, so uh, we assume that we also get some material as input. So for example, we can have rigid solar panels or curved solar panels. Um, and these, these are the two options that I will talk. Okay, so uh, let's say that somebody already gave us a solution. So we're done. We have our solar panel uh, bunny. How do you uh, evaluate? Okay, so um, there are two kind of uh, directions in which uh, we wish to evaluate such things. First, how similar is it to the input? So obviously, I can take a cube and panel it with uh, uh, planar solar panels, but then again, it's uh, it's not a bunny. On the other hand, um, can we actually make it? So fabricate it. Uh, in graphics, we're very good at faking it. So we can kind of texture map a bunny to, to look like it has solar panels on it. But essentially, um, you can't actually build such a thing because many of the panels are not flat. Um, and I'm going to have a small disclaimer here that essentially I'm going only going, when I talk about fab fabricatable, I'm only talking about geometry, not about the physics. So there are of course multiple issues such as wiring and cutting, et cetera. And if you use other materials, there are again, load bearing issues and, and a variety of physical constraints. And this talk, I'm going to talk about how far you can get only with geometry. Um, okay, so now that we know what we want to do, let's do our first attempt at the solution. Um, I, you know, 3D print my bunny. I buy some flexible solar, solar panels off of uh, Amazon or AliExpress or something. And now I start, start putting my uh, panels on the bunny. So I start in one direction, okay? And then I kind of run out of space. So I go in the other direction, but then I stop, I come back tomorrow. And now I start first in the red direction and then in the blue. But then what happens is I run into some consistency issues, right? So uh, it turns out that I can just start placing uh, quads on my bunny in any direction that I like. I have to somehow make sure that the way I'm placing them is, is consistent. Um, and uh, we, we, this means that we have uh, some choices to make. Uh, first is where do we start? Like where do we place the first tile? What is the size of the tile, which is in parentheses because I'm not gonna talk about it a lot. And uh, which directions do we wanna go? So once we have this, then this whole procedure that I described before uh, can be realized. So the directions that we want to go, well, we call them vector fields and I'm gonna talk about them a bit more in a second. Um, and the consistency issue that I showed means that the, these directions must agree. So in mathematical terms, this means that the vector fields should commute uh, or there should be some sort of integrability. And I'll try to give some uh, intuitive um, examples of, of what this means without going too much into, into the math. Um, okay. So uh, let's do a short interlude about, uh, about vector fields. So. Uh, we are all in graphics, we are aware of uh, rotational vector fields, okay? So a rotation vector field in, in R3, in the volume, at every place in my cube, I have a small arrow that kind of tells me uh, which direction I should go. And uh, analogously on a surface, I also have at every point on my bunny, I have a small arrow, but on the surface, uh, this is constrained. So essentially I can only go along the bunny and I cannot go up. Okay, so I'm going to work with tangent vector fields, which means that all my directions are kind of uh, like an ant would walk on the bunny, it cannot fly. Okay, um, okay. so uh, I can also look at a vector field as, uh, as a flow. Okay, so instead of thinking about the arrows, I can think about what happens to a point when I kind of uh, flow it along the, the, the vector field. So uh, in R3, if I'm now, uh, oops, if I'm now 
um, flowing the point, there's some trajectory that it's going to take. And on the surface, uh, it's also going to take a smooth trajectory. Okay. So again, a vector field can be either an arrow at every point or the flow that uh, and the movement that happens when you drop a particle in that. Now, uh, being in graphics, we know that uh, actually you can represent rotations with matrices, right? So I can take this uh, uh, rotation field and uh, the action it has on every point and represent it as a, a rotation matrix, which is just a matrix in uh, R three by three, yeah, three by three dimensional matrix. And interestingly, this can also be done on surfaces. So now, if I look at my, if I get a surface which is a triangle mesh and has uh, which has n vertices. Uh, then I can represent a vector field as uh, n by n uh, sparse matrix on my surface. So this is uh, interesting because it takes me from the geometric point of view of thinking about arrows and flows to the algebraic point of view of looking at matrices. And then some uh, kind, some of the conditions that allow me to put solar panels on, on my body can be expressed in algebraic terms. Um, okay. So uh, now let's look at these conditions, okay? The commutativity or the, the thing that guarantees that I don't have uh, consistency issues. Um, okay, so geometrically, yeah, in 3D, again, I'm, I'm contrasting 3D rotations with um, what happens on, on the surface when I follow a vector field on the surface, which is what happens when I'm doing the panel. So uh, in 3D rotations, we know that uh, actually uh, 3D rotations don't commute. Right. So if I have uh, some sort of MOOC book, let's try to do this. I don't know if it's going to work. Ah, no. OK, <laughs> we'll stick with the slides. If I have a, a book whose front is up here and I rotate it around the, uh, this axis and then I rotate it again around another axis, OK, then I'm not good. Uh, and alternatively, I'm going in the other direction. OK, I'm first rotating around the first axis and then around the second axis, then I'm going, not going to get the same thing. Okay, so this is uh, well known that in general, rotations in R3 don't commute. And if we look at the algebraic uh, meaning of this, this means that the two matrices R1 and R2, when you multiply them, the order matters. So you cannot multiply them in both directions. And if they do commute, okay, if R1, R2 equals R2, R1, then we know that uh, we're actually rotating around the same rotation axis. So this algebraic constraint of commutativity has some implications on the geometry uh, of what happens to uh, a particle under this rotation. There are some additional uh, results of commutation. For example, it has more or less the, has the same eigenvectors up to some asterisk mathematical detail that I don't want to go into. Okay, so this is like simple rotations are three by three matrices. Everybody knows about it. But interestingly, this can also work on the surface when I work with uh, vector fields on bunnies. So now the geometric picture is like I've shown before. Yeah, I'm taking my solar panel and I'm going in one direction. This is V1, the blue, and then I'm going along V2, or first I'm going along V2 and then along V1. And this, uh, I want these things to be, um, uh, to work nicely and give me some sort of, of closure so that I end up at the same point. And the algebraic picture is uh, essentially the same as rotation in 3D. So uh, basically what I'm saying is that the two matrices um, commute as matrices, okay? So I can multiply either dv1 uh, times dv2 or the other way around, where each matrix is the n by n sparse matrix representation of my vector field, uh, which I mentioned before that uh, it exists. And again, uh, if these commute, then they have the same eigenvectors, et cetera. So the algebra carries over, right? So you can look now at vector fields on surfaces like some uh, analog of uh, 3D rotations, if, if you'd like. They don't have to be rotations, but uh, the, the concept carries on. Um, okay, so now <laughs> let's get back to our solar panel bunny. What were our conclusions so far? Uh, first, we've seen that when we want to do quad paneling or quad matching, uh, this is a global problem. So I can just start placing things one next to the other and hoping that everything will kind of align no matter in which order I do it, I have to solve some uh, global optimization problem. And additionally, we've seen that we need two vector fields, V1 and V2, uh, such that the vector fields commute. And I defined commute using this uh, 
algebraic notation of uh, matrix commutation. Um, so now you can ask, okay, I give you two commuting vector fields, whatever that means. I didn't explain how to build a matrix, etc. Um, I mean, would, would this work? Would any two commuting vector fields work? And uh, the answer uh, uh, actually depends on what you want to do. So let's say we look at these two. I have a cylinder, okay? And uh, now I'm looking at these two uh, vector fields on my cylinder. Um, so uh, again, now this depends on the material, right? So if I want to put a quad on this in this direction, then this is going to work with a flexible quad, okay? I can wrap a flexible quad in, in this direction, but if I want to put a rigid uh, panel, this is not going to work anymore. And by work mean that I can place the four vertices of the panel on my surface, right? So uh, if the orientation is rotated like it's shown here, then I cannot do it. But if the panel is aligned with the principal coverage of the cylinder, then it is possible to do it. Um, okay, so <laughs> this means that there are additional requirements to the, my vector fields in addition to this uh, global um, commutativity constraint that I defined earlier. Okay, I need, I need to say something about the actual shape of the, of the panel and how it relates to the geometry of the surface. Um, okay, so if I have my vector fields, the nice thing is that I can um, characterize the shape of every element um, point-wise at P, depending on my vector field. So for example, if, if at the point P, I have two vectors V1 and V2, yeah, these are the vector field values at, at the point P, then the height of the quad is going to be given by the norm of the blue vector field V1 and the width from the norm of V2. And I can also control the angle by looking at the inner product between V1 and V2 divided by the lengths. Um, I, additionally, I can also control the planarity of this element. I won't go into the details again, but um, if I look at the uh, shape operator S, which is a uh, two by two matrix, which encodes the, the curvature at this point, then uh, I want them to be, um, if V1 and V2 are orthogonal with respect to this operator, then the quad that I'm going to, bet, to get will be able to be plain. Okay, so there are some differential geometry uh, involved in order to show this, but uh, this, is, uh, this is possible to show and has been done in, in previous. Um, okay, so now the thing is that, like I've shown previously, depending on the shape of the element with respect to the location that I am on the surface and the geometry of the surface, this kind of implies the material, right? So um, if I have planar quads, then I can uh, use rigid solar panels. For example, um, again, I'm ignoring all the wiring and the fact that you have to cut them. Uh, if I have developable quads, okay, so developable means that it can be flattened without any distortion, as much as it flattened, then I can use flexible solar panels. And uh, actually, I'm not aware of a published work that does this, so you know this can be an interesting homework. Uh, if I have planar quads, I can also do it with glass, for example, or from wood. If my shapes are uh, rhombi, okay, meaning that all the edge lengths are the same, uh, then I can use wire mesh as is shown for the bunny here. And if I have unit length, um, unit height layers, then I can use something like, uh, um, uh, like knitting or yarn. Okay, so essentially once I have, once I know how my uh, local panel, like my local element looks like uh, this, kind of tells me which material I can use to construct this from. Okay, so when I do the, the, when I model the problem, I say, okay, what I need is commuting vector fields and the shape of the element. And this will give me the, the possible feasible materials to kind of construct the, the surface. Um, but when I do the optimization, okay, when I'm trying to, to go back and kind of construct these, uh, um, these um, uh, surfaces, then my input is the required material, right? So somebody is going to tell me, do I have uh, like a rigid solar panel or a flexible solar panel and the, this uh, required material, material, or maybe I have yarn and this required material is going to apply, uh, imply the shape of the element that I need to use. And then I 
In addition, I have to have this constraint on the commuting vector force. Okay, so essentially what this means is once you tell me the material, then I can derive the mathematical constraints on the two vector fields such that when I uh, kind of use these vector fields to panel, I will get something that's, uh, that is realizable using the material that you gave. Okay, this is kind of general. This is not, obviously not true for any material that you throw at me, but uh, it's a kind of a desiderata for, for a few uh, works that I'm going to show in a few minutes. Um, okay, so of course, there are many, many gory details that I'm kind of glossing over. Um, you need, in order to do this, you need to formulate the optimization problem for vector fields. And this means that you need to say what are the variables and what is the objective and which algorithm you use to uh, uh, optimize for this objective and what are the initial conditions and when do you stop, et cetera, et cetera. Um, after you do all this, you end up with two vector fields on the surface, and you still need to build the, your quad mesh from that. And I'm kind of uh, not going into this aspect in this talk. I'm just assuming that this is some uh, existing work. And finally, you will need to do some post-processing. So if you do want this to be exactly planar, then you need to planarize. And again, I'm going to ignore this bit. Um, OK, so let's just talk about from all these things, I'm going to talk about just briefly about the variables and the objective. Uh, yeah, OK. So which variables are we going to use? Uh, this is actually very simple. So um, per face, right? So we're assuming we get as input this bunny as a triangle mesh. And then per face, I have uh, V1 and V2, which uh, every one of these is two numbers, basically. So it's uh, a vector represented in some arbitrary basis on this shape, arbitrary frame. So this gives me four numbers per face of the, of the mesh. Um, what about the objective? OK, so now let's think about the things that we've seen that we need to kind of throw into the, the soup in order to get vector fields which are usable. So the first thing I've shown is the commutativity, right? And uh, there are many, um, many ways to, to kind of describe it. Um, the most natural way, I guess, is to start from uh, Riemannian geometry, right? In, in the Riemannian geometry, one, the, the, um, the fact that two vector fields commute is kind of, you can express this mathematically using some rigorous formula. Unfortunately, this works for small vector fields on small surfaces, and what we get is like a, a triangle mesh bunny. So essentially, what we need is bunny calculus, right? So you have, you know, calculus on uh, in one dimension, in two dimensions, but we need calculus on a bunny. So uh, the way to get from the smooth differential geometry to uh, quantities and operators which uh, work on triangle meshes and are also uh, give you nice theorems, etc. Uh, this leads to uh, multiple uh, definitions of what this means for two vector fields to commute on, on a triangle mesh, right? So this is usually the, the heart of the uh, mathematical contribution is kind of understanding how to express commutativity on triangle meshes. Um, representing the, okay, so this is one part of the objective. Another part of the objective kind of represents the shape, right? So we said, for example, I might want, I might want to have rhombi, and in this case, uh, I'm going to say that the norm of the vector per face is going to be one. And then I'm going to get uh, quads which have uh, edge lengths, which is constant. And finally, any objective needs a regularizer. Um, so the, the issue here with the, with the regularizer, and I'm going to mention it a bit later, is that uh, in general, when you regularize, you kind of say, OK, I want things to be smooth. Uh, but here, uh, it's not exactly true because I have these issues that, uh, for example, if I look at this quad mesh here, then V1, V2, if I look at this point, um, at the point here, then uh, V1, V2 are um, one solution that makes sense here. But on the other hand, um, if I just flip the, the picture, then minus V1 and minus V2 is, is also a solution. Right? So there is some sort of uh, local symmetry that has to be taken into account when I'm considering smoothness. And I'm, I'll mention this uh, in a few slides again. Um, OK, so just kind of to, to give some uh, uh, flavor, example of the flavor of the results. Um, here, this is for uh, planar quads. Um, and uh, the way we computed it is uh, we use discrete commutativity. And what this means is we kind of <laughs> throw away the book about Riemannian geometry and just look at the, at the discrete problem. 
And then the question is, okay, if I have two neighboring triangles, um, I, I want to, uh, and in a second, I'll show that I want to flatten them to the plane. And then I have some constraint on every edge of this uh, triangle mesh in order to have uh, comm uh, commutativity and consistency. Okay, so this is this was done using discrete uh, formulation. Uh, and then in order to get the shapes uh, to be planar, then uh, I have to say something about the size of the quads, okay? So the size here is kind of uh, inverse to the curvature. So for example, in regions uh, such as here, uh, in regions such as here where the curvature is higher, I'm going to have smaller quads. And in regions such as here where the curvature is lower because it's flat and when you have larger quads, and essentially the sizing is computed automatically uh, by just giving a single number, which says how far do I wanna be from my input surface? And once you say that, this kind of uh, um, fixes the degrees of freedom and then you get this varying, uh, varying element size uh, depending on the, on the curve. Uh, you need here also orthogonality. So the two uh, vector fields should be orthogonal in order to get, um, you know, a 90, degree angles for the quads. Uh, you need alignment with the curvature lines. So the, the, uh, the quads kind of follow the curvature of the surface. And this is needed like I've shown earlier, because if you uh, misalign, then you're not able to place a planar panel, uh, which is not aligned with the curvature. Um, and uh, there's this conjugacy constraint, which I mentioned before. So all, by, by plugging in all these things into a, an optimization problem using just these variables that I describe. We use some standard optimization algorithm, nothing fancy, and uh, you end up with the with solution, which was kind of nice. I think here we even started from uh, a random initialization. So you just uh, randomize some vector fields and then you optimize and you get this. Um, oh, and, and the regularizer for, for saying, you know, what is the local symmetry of the vector fields? In which directions can I flip them? So here it's four. So if you use n equals four, then you get quads and we'll see a few more examples in a second. Um, okay, these are uh, two additional uh, solutions. Uh, so th these were kind of architectural meshes where the, the variance of curvature is not too big. But if you look at graphics meshes, such as the, the Mumu here, then uh, this, the, the problem gets uh, more difficult. Uh, and here we got some nice, uh, nice quads. Okay. Uh, this is another example. Here it's uh, Rombai, right? So this is like the, the stent example that I've shown in the beginning. Um, and here, so if you go to the shop and buy a mango, usually it comes covered with this net. And this is not an actual man mango, it's rendered, but uh, you can see that the, the shape looks natural. And this is an example of a rendered structure built from these, uh, these uh, Rombai. Um, so the way we, uh, defined commutativity here is by doing a discretization. So essentially, if you go to the book, uh, you're going to read that two vector fields commute if the covariant derivative is zero and the covariant derivative is defined in terms of some derivatives of the vector, um, some combination of derivatives. And then you can use finite elements or, or any type of uh, discretization to, to apply this to a surface. The downside, if you go this path, is that you will never get an energy that's exactly zero. And if, and if you do, it doesn't guarantee that you can actually construct the shape. So when you work with discrete, discretized uh, quantities instead of discrete, there are advantages and, and disadvantages. Uh, the shape here, I wanted uh, unit length to get the wrong by, and uh, there's also a bound on the angle. So you see, you cannot have, if you actually want to build this, you cannot have the angle here be too small because the, in reality, uh, these uh, uh, thin uh, lines actually have a width and they cannot collapse completely. So there's some bound on the angle here as well, which is part of the uh, constraints on the shape. Uh, the regularizer again is n equals four because I want to end up with quads. Okay. Um, so this is another example. This is uh, with planar hexagons. Uh, this is actually the, the most difficult uh, example. Um, so here again, we use discrete commutativity, uh, the sizing and coverage alignment, everything was very similar to the planar quads that I've shown earlier. The only thing that changes is the regularizer now is n equals six instead of being n equals four. Uh, and this is actually a difficult example because if you look closely, uh, you can see that the change, the, the shape of the element changes quite a bit. So 
In these regions, I have elements that look kind of uh, bricks. And uh, in these regions, like where the curvature is hyperbolic, I have elements that look like an hourglass. And in the regions like here, where the, everything is elliptic, then I have uh, elements that, that are convex. So uh, essentially, uh, the, one of the problems in, in planar hex meshing is that there are many, many constraints on the shapes of the elements, depending on the type of curvature uh, that you're working. Uh, and uh, this also, so for architectural uh, structures and, and models, this is uh, actually becoming easier, but you can see the nice alignment uh, with the curvature directions and the smoothly varying shape of the, of the elements from convex to concave. This is another architectural example and so on. Okay. Um, so like I said before, uh, hexagons is, is, a bit, uh, is a bit complicated. Um, some, again, are non-convex. And you can actually show that if you have Pringles, you know, like the, the chips, uh, which basically means a negative Gaussian curvature, and you want your elements to be hexagonal and planar, and the whole structure to kind of co uh, connect together nicely and be watertight, this essentially means that there is no solution in which all the elements are convex. Um, and so how do you go about generating these, uh, these meshes? Um, right, so if you look at, at the different uh, curvature regions, elliptic regions, or things that look like an ellipse are going to be convex, the cylindrical regions are gonna have these uh, brick shapes, and in hyperbolic regions, we're gonna have like the hourglass. So how is the shape actually determined from the V1, V2 that we solve for, right? Um, and what does orthogonality mean even in, in, this, uh, uh, in this setting and, and curvature line? So um, to, to, in order to explain how, to, how you end up with, uh, with the hexagon, I need to go back a bit to the, to the goalie details. So how do you go about building your quad mesh from your vector fields? Uh, what I told you so far is that you pick a point and you kind of place them one after the other. Uh, but this is kind of a bit of a lie because in reality, what happens is you take your mesh you uh, do a parameterization, so you cut it and you flatten it to the plane. Uh, and then you take a grid on that plane and you pull it back to your uh, input surface. And this gives you the, the mesh, right? So there is no actual placement of quads on your mesh. The, the quads are generated by slicing open the bunny, flattening it to the plane, and then pulling back the grid. Um, <laughs> and this is actually, uh, kind of amusing for generating this uh, bunny with a uh, mesh net on him. Uh, we actually fabricated in, in the way that I described. So uh, you take the, the parameterization that you got and you take a material, which is kind of uh, has this property that you can stretch it uh, in one direction, but all the edge lengths remain constant. And then you cut it according to your parameterization. Uh, which is what you see here. So this is a real material kind of pinned on the, on the blackboard. Um, and then the fact that you did all this process, all this optimization for the vector field, et cetera, means that when you kind of wrap your material around the, your 3D printed bunny, uh, it aligns nicely on the cuts, right? So if you look at this uh, area where the, uh, the two parts of the cut have to connect, then uh, we can see uh, then we can see that the, the lines here are continuous, right? So uh, are continuous across the cut. And this, this is basically all the uh, something that we tried to achieve. Um, okay, so why, why do we do this? Why do we uh, build the, uh, the mesh from the vector field this way instead of just putting one quad after another? Uh, essentially, any process that's iterative uh, is going to accumulate errors. And since we're doing an opt optimization, the, the objective is not going to be zero because this is a very non-convex problem and we end up with some solution, which is not necessarily the global, globally optimal solution. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily exist a solution with zero objective. So the commutativity is not going to be exact. So you're necessarily, uh, you know, kind of uh, accumulating errors and uh, once you do the global optimization, this spreads the error evenly across the surface, 
instead of kind of uh, putting all the error in the, in the, the location at the end. Um, and this is this is well known, right? So this is the way people do parameterization for a long time. Uh, in addition to this, that you're distributing the error more evenly, is that this is generalizable to other types of grids. So uh, for example, um, what I've shown here is I said, okay, you take, you flatten it to the plane, you do a kind of a grid, and then you pull it back. You pull the the quads, the quads that you got back to the surface. But you can use instead like a, a triangular grid, right? And then pulling it back to the surface, you get regular triangles on on your surface. So uh, essentially, you can use any grid that tiles the plane in order to do this process, and you will get elements, the shapes of the grid that you use to tile the plane. Um, Okay, so the final um, uh, pipeline for doing this uh, plane uh, hexagonal meshing is you get your surface and you define these constraints in terms, okay, I want this to be planar and uh, hexagonal, et cetera, et cetera, and follow the curvature directions. You optimize and you get this V1, V2. And uh, <laughs> when you pull back your grid to the surface, you end up with this uh, semi-regular triangle mesh, triangular mesh, which follows the uh, kind of the directions that you prescribed in the beginning, has the correct alignment and an isotropy. Um, then you dualize, okay? So you repress, uh, replace the semi-regular uh, triangle mesh with a semi-regular hexagonal mesh, which has convex faces. And finally, you planarize each face separately, okay? So this is this repeat, repeating iterative process where each uh, hexagon is planarized uh, separately. And you end up, this is how the non-convex shapes arise. Um, and you may say, okay, well, this is like super cheating because you planarize in the end and why can't I just take any hexagonal mesh on my surface and just planarize it? And the answer is it just looks very, very bad. <laughs> if you wanna see how this looks, I recommend you look at the paper. There are some examples of, well, if you do not align your surface correctly, your, if you do not align your vector fields correctly with the curvature features, for example, uh, and you do not do the sizing correctly, etc. then just planarization will give back garbage. So uh, a mesh that's very, very noisy. So the only way to get this nice planar hexagonal um, elements is by first um, making sure that all the elements are aligned correctly and only then doing the planarization. Um, okay, so this we actually, again, fabricated. I'm putting this in parentheses in, in the... This is not really fabrication. This works for one model. This is in no way scales, but you can take every uh, face and then kind of uh, actually project it into D. It's very close to being planar, but then it's still projected to be actually planar. You build these flaps and you number them and you kind of define how every two flaps connect. And then you can uh, cut these. Uh, you can <laughs> laser cut them, which makes more sense, or you can cut them by hand. Uh, and then you glue them together and you, and you get the structure and I actually have it here. I don't know if it's gonna work. Okay, so you can see all the uh, elements. Um, yeah, so there are some interesting uh, hexagonal elements here. And, and the reason we did all this is in kind of, kind of to, to make sure that we can, uh, actually, that this is actually fabricatable, right? So that the planarity that we guarantee, we measure it. We get some metric of planarity but we want to see that the tolerance is good enough to actually make it from cardboard. Um, okay, so why, why is the math hard in, in all this? Remember, this is the, the objective. Uh, the commutativity is difficult because the smooth theory promises commutativity and integrability, uh, promise me, promises that commutativity will guarantee integrability, yeah? And then if I have commutativity, I will have consistent quads. But in practice, first I'm finding this V1, V2, and then I'm finding the quads, so uh, there is some mismatch there. And the discrete theory currently is what we have in this uh, planar hexagonal meshing paper uh, that gives discrete integrability that's defined directly on the flattening on the, in terms of the triangles. Um, and it kind of doesn't relate to the commutativity concept that's defined in smooth differential geometry. In addition, it doesn't address at all the finite element size is again a problem. So what's missing is a consistent discrete flow of discrete elements, um, which doesn't exist uh, at the moment, to the, the best of my knowledge. Uh, the regularization is also difficult because usually what you do is just you throw some Laplacian at it, 
But here, uh, the, the vector fields themselves are not smooth because of the symmetry issue that I mentioned before. So if you look here, these are the final vector fields that I generate that we generated the quad meshes from. And you can see that there are regions where the thing is simply disconnected, yeah? Uh, <laughs> so there are um, inconsistencies in the vector field that the regularization has to uh, take care of. And this is uh, another difficult issue. So the regular the regularizer should be able to handle these continuities. We used in in the in this project we used the complex roots to represent n fold rotation, which was pioneered by uh, Knopel et al. from 2013. Uh, but this is has its own issues in in terms of the optimizer. Um, okay, just very very quickly, I'm going to talk about layered materials. So uh, paneling or meshing is hard, like we said. Yeah, perhaps layered material is simpler. So layered material, I mean that you uh, put one layer at a time. This kind of makes the problem a bit one-dimensional. Uh, examples of applications is uh, FDM 3D printing and uh, knitting and crochet. Um, so the model is built in layers, which essentially means that each layers, oh, I mean, in these two specific examples, means that each layer's height is uh, fixed uh, or bounded. So this means that instead of <laughs> uh, walking the way I walked before, I can work with geodesics, uh, geodesic distances. Um, so instead of specifying my problems in terms of vector fields, I can specify my problems in terms of geodesic distances. Um, <laughs> so just briefly, geodesic distance is the distance on the surface from a seed point P. And um, when you actually um, use this distance to generate knitting instructions and you knit it, you see that the resulting uh, rows of the knitting follow exactly with the uh, geodesic uh, isolines that you draw on the surface. So this is on the left is a rendering and on the right is a picture of a real uh, knitted object, for example, yeah. Um, okay, so there are many ways to compute it. Um, <coughs> we have, I'm going over this quite quickly because I think I, I don't have much time. So we have uh, customized, uh, customizable geodesic distances and you can uh, see this at SIGGRAPH this year. Uh, my student Michal is going to present it, so I'm not going to go into all the details. The main idea is that you can put a point and compute the geodesic distances from the point, but you can add additional constraints, which kind of say, okay, in some regions of the mesh, in small number of places, I want, for example, my geodesic distance to align with uh, some vectors. Um, okay. Once you do that, you can uh, generate uh, instructions for uh, crochet stuff toys, for example, or Miku Umi. Uh, yeah, this is the model that I showed a second ago. <laughs> uh, so essentially the stitch has a constant height um, and we form the rows from the isolines of the geodesic distance from the seed. Uh, my V1, V2 are, are given in, in, in terms of the um, this geodesic distance. So V1 is tangent to the isolines of the geodesic distance and I get V2 from uh, integrability. Um, Okay, <laughs> so my the, this um, uh, commutativity constraint can be expressed uh, quite easily in terms of the if if I know that I'm working with geodesic distances, uh, so my v one is going to be the gradient of the geodesic distances rotated by power over two, and then I have a very simple constraint on the vector on the second vector field. Uh, from these two vector fields, we build a graph, and then you can uh, generate the knitting instructions. Uh, that give you the, the toy. And we have some uh, non-trivial results. Uh, again, there, there are some more gory details because in some cases you have to kind of decompose the shapes, the shape into a few parts, um, but the, the connection is seamless. So in Homer here we show, we knitted every one of these with a different color just to show, to visualize the parts. But essentially if you knit everything from the same color, you don't see the, the seam which is also kind of nice. And the designer has some control here because they can pick the initial position. Uh, fabrication, again, uh, the output of this uh, code is uh, um, knitting instructions. So uh, you actually get something that looks like crochet knitting. We had some people that work in programming languages uh, help us with this. Uh, and here you see the, the procedure. Um, we hired some uh, knitters and uh, they will manage to work with our instructions and you, this is the final uh, bunny that you get. Again, it's not exactly the shape of the input bunny. There's some smoothing involved, etc. And, and there are some additional physical constraints which need to be taken care of. 
Okay, so what other things we want to do? We want to work with the additional materials. Uh, the, in terms of the theory, I mean, there's a, there's a big problem with the, the integrability that the translational integer degrees of freedom are not handled. Um, and there's no complete discrete theory. And of course, adding physics is, is will considerably improve the outputs uh, and as well as handle interactive design. Uh, in, able to, in order to be able to handle interactive design, we need to reduce the computation time so everything can be uh, done it, uh, interactively. So to conclude, uh, I've shown a general pipeline where when you uh, give me some material, I tell you, okay, we, what are the, um, what's the element shape that this material should have? And together with commutativity, this gives me a way to construct bunnies from this material or other difficult shapes. Uh, the theory uh, has uh, some missing bits in terms of discrete commutativity and integrability. There are many interesting open questions. And the framework is applicable to many materials that the one I've shown, but we're hoping to extend it. Uh, thank you, and I'm happy to add questions, to answer questions. Okay, thank you very much for the very nice talk. Uh, now it's the time for questions and answers. I, I didn't see any. So I would like to ask uh, the first question. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think you know the geodesic net, right? Geodesic net, I, I think, uh, uh, do you think you can use your method to compute the code mesh with it uh, uh, similar to the uh, geodesic net? Because you have the constraint for the code side and you have constraint for the uh, angles uh, between the, uh, the lines. Uh, yeah. yeah, we, um, so geodesic nets are also very constrained. We haven't actually uh, tried computing them, but it can be an interesting uh, application. I'm assuming you also need to constrain the, the norm of the vector field to be constant. Um, so basically, I I'd, I'd derived the conditions to uh, on the you know the pointwise conditions on the vector field that will give me this. Uh, but I remember seeing some papers on that, and I remember that the problem was uh, highly constrained. So the, the one of the issues we have now is that I think the optimization is not mature enough um, because we're just using some off-the-shelf optimizer. So maybe, you know, if you have a very difficult objective, it may be required to kind of generate a more uh, specific uh, optimization uh, solver. Uh, okay, but yeah, yeah in yeah. theory, you could try to do this with the uh, next. Okay, okay. Project. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, yeah. I, re I read your paper and uh, I found your, uh, your work is based on solid uh, theoretical analysis. And uh, the, this uh, theoretical analysis often begins with uh, smooth surfaces. And uh, when we transition to triangular meshes, uh, we, I see we have two approaches to handle the uh, discretization. Right, the first approach discretized the equation derived for smooth cases, which is actually a approximation method and may introduce approximation error. Mm -hmm. Right, and the second method is to directly define some new rules or equation for the discrete cases, ensuring that some certain properties can be exactly satisfied. But my question is which approach do you think is the more effective in solving the problem. Of, of course, the second approach, I mean, the discrete approach is more interesting uh, uh, theoretically, but uh, in terms of solving the problem effectively, uh, which approach do you think is, more, uh, uh, is better? So I, I think this really depends on the mesh that you have. So if you have a very nice mesh with lots of triangles that is smooth and nicely represents a smooth surface, I don't think it actually matters. So it won't, it's not gonna matter like which, how do you discretize your vector fields? Or because it's a very good, because the triangle mesh is a very good approximation of a smooth surface, then usually your approximate quantities work okay. But if you have a coarse mesh, and often in architecture, you start with meshes which are, which are kind of coarse, then it starts to matter how you discretize, right? And, uh, and the approach that we used here is um, for the planar hexagons, uh, we use the discrete approach. Right, so we didn't discretize yes. commutativity. We said, okay, every triangle has to kind of connect together nicely, and and this is what we optimize for. 
And I think this is, um, I mean, both methods can lead to good results. I'm not complaining on, one of, on none of them, but this is easier to kind of work with because when, when it breaks, it's, it's kind of easier to see like what exactly goes wrong because it's directly related to the triangle match that you work. So yes, the answer kind of depends on your input, but I'm, I'm a big fan of the discrete uh, things, even though you can say, okay, but this is only the theory. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, 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 thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, 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 I have another question actually. Uh, uh, because uh, nowadays the deep learning methods are very popular, right? And uh, do you think deep learning method can be applied to solve the uh, vector field computation problem? Uh, do you have any suggestion on this topic? Uh, well, for apply to what did you say exactly? I must uh... apply to the vector field computation. Ah, to vector fields. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'm 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 not a deep learning expert. <laughs> Far yeah. from it. I think. Yeah, it's it probably could right. So you, you the issue is you're gonna be you're gonna need data, and uh, on triangle meshes data is already difficult. So vector field data as tangent vector fields is kind of even harder uh, difficulty. But uh, I think there are many people working on this problem at the moment. So I, I expect that this, uh, there will be some uh, examples of how to do this on triangle meshes as well, because the, the, there's a big uh, gain to have, right? Because deep learning was so successful on all the other things. So only for vector fields on triangle meshes, it doesn't work. It's going to be somewhat surprising. So I think it probably could be applied, but I'm, I'm not, the, not the expert on the deep learning aspect. <laughs> Okay, okay, thank you very much. And uh, uh, since uh, due to the time limit, I think uh, we, we should go, uh, move on to the next talk. So thank you, uh, Professor Ben Chen. Thank you very much for your very nice thank talk. You. Thanks thank for you. having me. Bye.